experience of down. So when the mother of all downs in the economy happened, there was no capacity to actually deal with it. So that was the next unprecedented, and, and there just wasn't the capacity in the economy to accommodate this. So what did we do? Well, we do what we always do when we don't have capacity to do something. We panic. And we turned around and looked at our governments and said, you've got to do something about this. And so there was a huge cry to the monetary authorities of the world and to the fiscal authorities of the world to do something about this. And that led to the next unprecedented event that happened. The, the most, I believe, uh, sizable, the most synchronized, and the swiftest, three S's there, package of stimulus that I believe the world has ever seen. Uh, it was in the OECD nations worth 4% of GDP. I think there were a few emerging markets that were more than that, the trillion dollars inside of India in terms of the stimulus package is a hefty chunk of Indian GDP spread out over a number of years, admittedly. But when that comes in, it has a very big impact on the bottom line. China's, China always does things big, 13% of its GDP. So three times as big as the average OECD package relative to the economy. Well, that was a massive amount of outpouring into the economy. And it had great effect. It came in in the fourth quarter of 2009 and the first quarter of 2010. And everybody was very pleased by the result. And my profession was very guilty of saying at that point, aha, we have a recovery. And it certainly looked like a recovery. The rates of growth around the world were substantial. And it wasn't just government spending inside of the GDP accounts that was going up. It was government spending, it was consumption, it was investment, trade flows were affected by this. It looked like it was a true integrated recovery. And then it stopped. Why was that? Well, like any spending program, it spans a number of quarters. But the dynamics in a, the spending program are that you ramp up in terms of growth over, let's say, an eight to 10 quarter program, and you might get two or three quarters of growth. And then you get up to peak spending levels. You get to a point where you're spending hundreds of billions of dollars this quarter just to replace the hundreds of billions of dollars you spent in the last quarter. And grade four math tells us zero growth. And if you don't have organic growth happening under, underlying, in the underlying economy, if that hasn't spurred something else, then you get zero growth overall in your economy at best. Now, the reason that this did not kickstart the world economy in our view, and we actually forecast this at the time, we can now say it comfortably in retrospect, but we forecast this at the time. We said we are going to get a negative square root effect you know, you have a down, you have an up, and then all kinds of flat. And we were warning Canadians that this was going to happen. And indeed, it did happen at that point in time. And the reason for that was the stimulus came in far too early. Like, this is very similar to what happened in the Great Depression, with one key difference. When the Great Depression occurred, activity levels dropped, and they stayed low for a very long period of time. And John Maynard Keynes came along and said, you know, this has been too low for too long because we have now used up the excesses of the Roaring Twenties, but we still don't have a world economy that's kickstarting. It's not getting back on its feet again. And it needs a boost. And that's when deficit financing was first born as an idea. And so it came in, and many judge it was very effective. I believe if it was effective, it was because the world was ready to get back to balance. But psychologically, it had been so low for so long, somebody came along and said, this is a new normal. It's different this time, although the difference is that we're going to be at a low level of activity and low levels of growth forever. That was the psychology of the market. And Maynard King said, we've got to break the economy out of that psychology, and we've got to do it with shock and awe. So it was effective back then. Our problem is we used up all of that gunpowder 
before those excesses were used up. So when that gunpowder was all lit and came into the world economy with great fanfare, and then got up to those peak spending levels, we got back to the business of wearing down that five-year excess. And so we've had all kinds of flat, and now many are out there in the world economy saying, well, you know, we just don't seem to be able to kickstart growth here. Maybe this <coughs> is a new normal. Exactly the same thinking that happened post Great Depression. Our problem now is we don't have any monetary stimulus to offer the economy. We don't have any fiscal stimulus to offer the economy. We have a great problem. So that's where we are now. That's where we've come from, and that's where we are now. And that's where our economists in our shop say, okay, well, this is our <coughs> landing point. How on earth do we forecast this going forward? If the economy in the world needs a boost at this point, where is that boost going to come from? Is it going to come from an industry? Not likely. They're so <coughs> integrated together that one is not likely to jump up and save the rest of the world. Even Apple is not going to be able to do that. It's likely going to be either a country in the world or a region of the world that's going to do that. So the question we debate as a team is, are there any candidates? Has anybody got the momentum that is actually going to pull the rest of the world along? Are there any growth engines out there? Well, I think we can all comfortably write off Europe. Europe saw that stimulus was the way of getting the economy back on its feet. But it hasn't got its economy back on its feet, and now the answer is austerity. <coughs> and so they've self-inflicted uh, their economy with a recession, but they have caused a recession by virtue of pulling back everything that they put into the economy. So they tried to boost it, they failed, they pull it all back again, caused a double-dip recession that could teeter the world in the wrong direction, and all they've got to show for it is a mountain of debt. Does that make any sense to you? It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, but anyway, um, they're the ones that have to make the tough decisions. The bottom line <coughs> for Europe is it's not playing the role of the growth engine, and it's not likely to for a number of years. So we can take that chunk of world GDP off the table. Well, that's 17, 18% of world GDP, that's a big chunk of GDP just to take out of the picture and say, that's not an engine. In fact, it's probably a caboose with the brakes on. So who, uh, who else is a candidate? Well, if you look at growth in Japan at the moment, that's 9% of world GDP. You think, well, it's a possibility that Japan could actually be that growth engine. Except the growth that Japan is seeing at the moment is largely reconstruction funds from the earthquake and tsunami from last year. And that's not going to last. That's like a stimulus program on top of a stimulus program. So you know what those stimulus programs do. Japan is not the solution. So there's an additional 9% of GDP we can take off the table. Now, this profession is called the dismal science for a good reason. I'm going to make you very dismal for a few more minutes here. Just bear with me. What are the other candidates? Well, many look to emerging markets, large emerging markets, like India, and said, well, these are the engines of the world economy now. And the reason that they said that was because of the superior rates of growth that had been sustained for quite some time. But now we have the slowdown that is affecting those largest markets. And there's a lot of worry. There's a lot of worry about Canadian exporters, but we're not the only ones that are worried about this. Because this synchronized slowdown has occurred, and relatively recently, there's a lot of worry about that. We never felt uh, that the term engine should be used for these economies because although their rates of growth, your rates of growth, are superior and are boosting the world average and helping the world economy along by virtue of the ascendancy of the economies, to be a true engine, you've got to be able to pull the rest of the world economy along with you. And this isn't happening because the markets, whether we're talking about China, whether we're talking about India here, or Brazil, or Russia, or Mexico, or anybody that we would put into that club are not deep enough in terms of the integration of the economy yet to be able to do that. Per capita incomes have to be higher. Consumption as a share of GDP has to be higher. The levels have to be higher to have an organic solution coming from any kind of economy. And so at the risk of offending you all, 
I believe that the only candidates that can take the role of engine in this very difficult period of time are developed economies. Well, we're quickly narrowing our list down to one economy that's still on the table. And many have given up on the United States of America because all we hear in the news is that politicians in Washington cannot get together to make any kinds of decisions about their own fiscal problem. And they have a huge fiscal problem. They're the number one economy in the world. They have the world's reserve currency, more so now than even five years ago. And they are faced with their own fiscal conundrum. Their debt to GDP ratio has gone from 65% to 105% in a very short period of time. Well, Canadians know that when you get around that 100% debt to GDP ratio, the ratings agencies get very nervous because we went through that in the early 1990s and had to go through a jobless recovery in the 1990s as our government at the federal and provincial level completely retooled fiscal finance. A very painful time for Canada, very etched in our memories, but very necessary. And we came through that with flying colors. We were generating huge surpluses and in fact had an embarrassment of riches. That's what can happen to fiscal finances, but America's not there. They can't come to the table, they can't agree on things, they keep increasing their debt ceilings and putting things off. Moreover, they are faced with huge public sector pension liabilities, public sector health care liabilities that don't make the future of their fiscal finances look very good. So am I taking the number one economy off the table as well? Not so fast, because things are going on inside the U.S. economy at the moment that I believe illustrate its fundamental strength and its unique position to be able to claim the role of engine. And I'm wondering if I can convince you, without having any PowerPoint slides here, that this is actually going on in America. 70% of the US economy is the consumer. That's about 10% more than the average economy in the rest of the world. So consumers are very important in the US economy. In fact, they govern about 14 cents of every dollar that circulates worldwide, direct. So they're a powerful group of people. How have they been doing lately? Well, if you look at real retail sales series that are generated by the St. Louis Fed, prior to markets shutting down in the middle of the summer because of the Greek election fiasco, that series was growing at a 5% inflation-adjusted rate annualized. Now, 5% in the U.S. economy don't usually go together. You know, we're used to hearing something much more like 2%. But I'm telling you that 70% of the U.S. economy was actually on a 5% trajectory. Well, let's just save that for now. And in fact, let me encourage you further because spending did shut down over the summer with a caveat. Everybody got very nervous over the summer, so U.S. consumers reined in, but incomes didn't. So every penny that they did not spend, they saved. They actually socked away $70 billion over that three-month period of time. Where, uh, where they were very nervous about things. Well, that is pretty good dry powder going into the final months of the year and into 2013, because that money can still be spent. So when that summer period was over, we now have data post that period where we're feeling a whole lot comfortable, more comfortable about Europe, and the number sprung back up again. What I love about this is that the savings rate did not plunge. They held on to their savings but they resume a very strong spending trajectory. I believe that's going to continue into the fourth quarter of this year, and that U.S. consumers are beginning to wake up in a really big way. It's just U.S. consumers. I'm even more excited about what's going on in the U.S. housing market. Now, you've probably all heard about the U.S. housing market. It's, it's, it's been blamed for everything that has gone on in the world in the last number 